Hello, my name is Maria Jolliker. Welcome to my show, Let's Talk About History. I'm here today at the Otis Library where the Norwich New London, the New London Historical Society is going to have a lecture on Francis Calkins. Nancy Deanberg, PhD, will be presenting the lecture. So we'll watch the lecture and I hope you enjoy my show. Thank you. Thank you for coming out on uh, Saturday before Easter for this program. This is a wonderful turnout, by the way. I appreciate you all. You all found parking, obviously. <laughs> I'll take that as a yes. Something that people always talk about before they talk about the program is where do I park? As long as nobody's complained, I'll take that as a moral victory. Um, it's a real pleasure being here this afternoon uh, for a couple of reasons. Not only because it's great to see Nancy. Uh, I, Nancy is uh, a, an old friend and, and colleague for many, many years, and it's a pleasure to be able to have her in speaking at Otis Library. Uh, I'm Bob Farwell, and I'm wearing two hats today. I'm both the library's director, but I'm also the program chairman for the New London County Historical Society, who we are collaborating on today. And wearing my Pat, as the head of the program committee, uh, I just want to invite you all to come to the New London County Historical Society, which, for those of you who don't know, is on Bank Street in the Shaw Mansion. There is a great deal of information back there on our upcoming programs and initiatives. And New London's only a few miles away, ladies and gentlemen. We're all in New London County. And I know if you came from New London, you think it's Norwich. Yes, we're still in New London County. It's not Wyndham County, and it's not Rhode Island. Right? So just to clarify that. Uh, it's also a great day for Otis Library because this is a program that is part of our observation of Harris Sisters Month which I think, as you know, April uh, was declared by the state to be Harris Sisters Month. And there is a great deal of information on the back table, more than I can possibly remember, about the significance of the Harris Sisters and their participation in, uh, in the first, uh, in, uh, who was it, Julie? The name of the woman who started the school. Oh, there you go. Yes. Um, I was doing real well till I was 55, and at 67 I can't remember anything. Anyway, they were involved with that. Uh, without going into any more details, I'd just like to notice, note that Nancy is going to be speaking about Frances Manwer and Calkins, and both about her life and her work in Norwich, but more specifically about her involvement in the abolition movement in Norwich, where she was the first president of the Norwich Femin Female and Anti-Slave Society, and the University of Connecticut Avery Point campus since 1986. She's currently the Associate Director of Academic Advising and Assistant Director of the Bachelors as the President of the Connecticut Coalition for History and the Editor of the Connecticut History Review, the only scholarly journal on Connecticut history. So I think those are pretty significant accomplishments. And with that, I would like to introduce Nancy. And thanks again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for having me here. I'm used to talking to crowds, so if I'm not loud enough, just do this and I'll get louder. All right? Um, as Bob said, I've been in history for a long, long time. I actually met Frances Hawkins, not in person, um, my first year of graduate school at UConn in 1991. Kit Collier, who was then the state historian, assigned everyone in the seminar to research certain aspects of Connecticut history. And the state historian didn't even know much about Frances. He said she had published a book on the history of New London in 1895. So would I read the book and would I find out about Francis and present a paper? Well, Francis was born in 1795, okay? There's no way she published that book in 1895. She actually did publish A History of Norwich in 1846, A History of London in 1853. 
most of what I'm talking about today is Frances and her life and works in Norwich. But also, what I love about presenting history papers is that I can speculate. And so I'm going to be speculating in a number of areas, which include the areas concerning Prudence Crandall and the Harris sisters. But serendipity is often part of researching, even writing history. Historians toil in archives. They seek little tiny bits of evidence, a piece of paper here, a signature there. They're looking for evidence that brings the person to life. They're looking for evidence for why that person was significant. And of course, the longer ago a person lived, the harder it is to find those little bits. I started researching Francis back in literally 1991. And I've published a couple articles about her. I wrote the introduction for the reissue of the history of New London and the history of Norwich. And at the time when I wrote that, I pretty much had done all the research I thought I could. Um, Frances herself was an inveterate researcher. She delved into town records, diaries, letters, gravestones, oral histories. She met and learned the language of the Mohegans and the Pequots. And she created 25 books of pronouncing gazetteers and dictionaries of Mohegan and Pequot language that the tribes have used to reconstruct their languages. She saved all her research. Now, she'd be in big trouble because when she went up to the Connecticut State Library, she brought a nifty little sharp pen and she cut out people's signatures off documents. Okay? Now, most of those documents, someone decided in the ensuing 200 years, um, worked worth saving and they don't exist anymore. But periodically when I was researching, I would find a document like John Winthrop Jr. with a space mm -hmm. where the signature should have been. George Washington with a space where the signature should have been. And in the New London County Historical Society is Calkins' autograph book. Oh, wow. Where she's pasted the <laughs> signatures where they are absolutely worthless. Okay? She was the first female member of the Massachusetts Historical Society, in part because of her wide-ranging research. And I'll give you some more detail about that. She was elected a corresponding member in 1849. She was the only female member of the Massachusetts, County, Massachusetts Historical Society until 1966. Okay? That gives you some measure of how the white Harvard-educated members value her research back in the 1840s. Now, in reconstructing, researching Calkins' life, I found she was more than a researcher. She participated in many activities that defined what was known as the women's sphere in the 19th century. Um, she supported her mother and her sister and her half-siblings by teaching school for more than 20 years. She was a prolific contributor to the American Tract Society. Um, and as I'll detail, some of her tracks ended up in, in Singapore and in India in press runs of 800,000 copies. That's how important the Tract Society thought her writings were. She was the first and founder of the Norwich Female Anti-Slavery Society, um, but she also was the longtime secretary of the New London um, Seamen's Friends Society, which was a society that tried to provide help and assistance to the families of New London and Norwich seamen and to the sailors themselves if they came home. She was a poet. She wrote hundreds of poems. Some of them are really bad. <laughs> <laughs> but I had trouble reconstructing her early life because she really had left nothing personal. And I want you to, to empathize with me. About 10 years ago, I was researching at the Melinda County Historical Society. And Trish Royston, who was then the librarian, brought out what I would call a little pasteboard copy book. Kind of like those blue books you used for high school and college exams. It had a pasteboard cover. And I opened it up, and on the first line, it said, Early Life of F. M. Hawkins. Now, I had researched Francis enough. I can read her handwriting in my sleep and it was Francis's handwriting. There was no question in my mind that at about age 40, Francis had started writing an autobiography. 
And the very first line answered a question I had been asking myself since 1991. Why had she stepped so far outside of her sphere? Why hadn't she married? Why had she become a writer? Why had she done all of these things that were so abnormal for women in the period? She was born in 1795, died in 1869. This is what she wrote. The fire within me will not be smothered. I am oppressed with a superabundance of thought and feeling. It constrains me to write. So much enjoyment must communicate itself. I have laid up years of experience. I've gathered stacks of adventures. I have gathered heaps of incidents and autographs. Ah, I'm full of endless biographies and seem to myself to have lived hundreds of lives in hundreds of characters with innumerable varieties of circumstances. What is wanting but an embodiment? Why should I not open the floodgates and let utterance issue forth? So she, by age 40 to 45, knew she wanted something different than what the typical woman wanted in the 1830s. So she was born in 1795 in London to a widowed, impoverished teenage mother. She grew up in the household of her maternal grandfather, Robert Manwaring. Manwaring was a tanner and a farmer. And when he moved to Norwich in, when Francis was eight, so about 1803, he became a shopkeeper. He eventually was elected to the Board of Select when he became a deacon at the First Congregational Church. She had scant opportunity for formal education. Her mother never worked. Her mother never really left the paternal household. I'll give you some details in a minute. But Frances used her few terms at the local schools and an extraordinary four months at a school for young ladies founded here in Norwich to make something of her life, to rise above her limitations. Her overwhelming desire to learn, coupled with her background, gave her this drive to excel. I mean, she wrote, in that autobiography that her, her ancestors left her very little but that's what she called a crooked Welch name and a crooked back. Okay? And they were farmers, a couple were tanners, but none of them were particularly distinguished. She managed to achieve middle class gentility. She managed to become a historian whose books are still valuable, that people who want to know about the early history of Norwich and New London they go straight to Francis's books. She was inspired to achieve beyond the level of a typical woman in 19th century America. She supported her widowed mother, her siblings, herself, um, for 14 years as a teacher. As I said, she participated in voluntary associations. She founded several. If you look at any of the New London and even some of the Norwich papers from the 1830s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, there's usually something by contributor F.M. Calkins. Sometimes they write it out, sometimes they don't. But Francis had like a weekly column in the, um, a weekly paper in New London. I'm blanking on the name of it. Depository. Depository, thank you very much. And it was history related or Washington's visit to, to uh, Norwich and New London and a wonderful visit of a Norwich man to Washington's Mount Vernon. And this was a guy who had apparently served under Washington during the war. And he managed to get to Mount Vernon, and he rode up to the front door as George was going out for a ride. Mm -hmm. And he introduced himself to George, and George said, well, I remember you, yes. Come on in and have breakfast. The man went in, George went out on his ride. Never talked to him again. <laughs> <laughs> okay? But um, she found all these stories. Um, her intelligence was notable. She wrote in that autobiography, I have no recollection, I forget I have a PowerPoint, sorry. I have, I have no recollection of being taught to read, spell, sew, or knit. It appears to me I was always acquainted with these mysteries. Well, think about it. I remember the day I learned to tie my shoes sitting on the stairs of my house. 
I don't remember being taught to read, but I do remember not knowing how to read. And here's a woman who said, I don't even remember being taught. It's like she was born reading. She recalled that she attended a one room, she called it country school in New London. This is before she was seven. She actually was like four or five. And um, the older student sat at the front of the room. And these were the 18, 19 year old. She called them the um, broad shouldered lasses and, um, no, sorry, broad shouldered lads and buxom lasses who during the winter would go back to school for a couple months to try to you know, fulfill the shortages of their education. And the schoolmaster one day challenged the front row to spell Bozen. Front row, can you spell Bozen? Well, New London was a maritime community and every single one of the 20 older students, because he went row to row to row, spelled it B-O-S-U-N. Okay? So the schoolmaster put it into the back row where what Francis called the ABCD Aryans sat with horn books and picked up what learning they could. And he brought little Francis to the front row and he stood her in front of the class and he asked her to spell the word. Clearly and accurately, she spelled it out, B-O-A-T-S-W-A-I-N. The teacher then placed her in the front row with the older students. He, she said, to shame the older students rather than to reward her success. But in retaliation, the older students called her master's baby for the rest of the term, an early version of teacher's pet. Now she took full advantage of her access to education. Her half-brother wrote that she would come home every day after school and write out her lessons on scrap pieces of paper. She read the Iliad and Odyssey before they moved to Norwich when she was seven. She began to study Latin. She also read many of the English authors of the 17th and 18th century because Robert Manwaring had a fairly good library. Now, Frances was intelligent, but she was also fortunate. By the 1790s, Americans had a new idea about education. Many people in the United States had come to believe students needed to learn Republican virtues. And that the best teachers of those Republican virtues were not Yale graduates with a big whip who beat the kids' knowledge into their heads, but that women would be better teachers to inculcate values of honesty and loyalty and patriotism. Mm -hmm. Education for girls became important to teaching and preserving public values. Who was in a better position than mothers? It meant that the education for girls expanded. In the 1790s, if girls made it past much about third grade and their families could afford it, they learned how to paint miniatures on ivory, to paint flowers, to do a you know, fine needlepoint. They did not get anything else than that. Now, Coffins moved to Norwich at age eight, following tragedies and disasters in her maternal grandfather's family. She arrived near the First Congregational Church in Norristown at night, in the middle of a thunderstorm, because her grandfather was moving into a house next to the First Congregational Church. So the first time she saw her new home was the next morning. Next to the house was a gigantic elm tree. And high up on the hill behind the church, and that hill is still there, was a massive chestnut tree. And she recalled thinking, Norwich, Norwich must be a very ancient place. These trees are Indian kings. The very next day, Calkins met Nancy Hyde a young woman who was very influential. I keep forgetting I have the PowerPoint. I want to talk to you about this. This is Francis's first publication. About 10 years ago, I got an email from someone in Maryland, and she said, I just bought Needlepoint at an antique auction, and I've been researching it, and it's the Francis Calkins, and I apologize, this is through glass. The woman has said when I finally write the book on Francis, she will take it out, have it professionally photographed so I can use it. Doesn't make a great PowerPoint. But the bottom line says Francis M. Calkins, New London, Connecticut. Okay? Um, 1802, I think. 
Um, and so Frances created this again, this young woman who said she could never remember not knowing how to sew, not knowing how to write, not knowing how to read. Hmm. Um, that is supposedly the Robert Manwaring House on Manwaring Hill in New London. I've seen pictures of the Robert Manwaring House, which was disassembled a number of years ago. And it's, it's a four square colonial with entry doors on all four sides. And it was on Manwaring Hill. So she did a picture of the specific house, she did the alphabet, she did the numbers, and it's an amazing piece of work for a seven-year-old girl. Um, but then going back to Nancy Hyde, Nancy Hyde was about four or five years older than Coffin, so 12 maybe, um, and she became a friend and mentor to the young Francis, who was kind of lost in a household that consisted of five of her aunts, her mother, um, two step-uncles, or half-uncles, because her first grandmother had died, her father had remarried, the second wife had died after giving birth to a son, he remarried again when he moved to Norwich, that wife died and giving birth to another son. There were something like nine children in the household. And Frances later said she had the curvature of the spine because she was always walking around with a baby on her hip when her own bones were still forming. But Nancy Hyde took her under her wing, taught her various dances, um, had her inc included in little plays that Nancy Hyde and her friends put on, supplied Frances with books, encouraged her to write, encouraged her to draw. Hawkins wrote that Hyde's genial companionship, she's like seven, eight years old, opened doors in her mind and heart, giving her the first glimmerings of the idea that a girl could be more than a daughter or a mother. So Frances was extraordinary as a young child. And as I'll talk about in a few minutes, Hyde was critically important to Frances's later education. Frances wrote of her early years in Norwich with affection, calling them the most exciting, care-forgetting portion of her life. She said her days had been cloudless except for some ill health. Um, she said, I had my daily tasks, my lessons at home, my walks, my books, my evening, evening visits, my sports, and my letters to write. We had our parties, our bows, our games, and our dances. We invented novels, improvised speeches, and presented dramas. With her companion, she did the activities of childhood, sliding and skating, gathering flowers, picnicking, gathering berries and nuts, and what she called sailing on the Yantic River. Okay? She said that when the stream was high, they would sail, and use that in quotation, on the river. One of the boys would sit on the bottom of a plank that had washed down the stream and paddle it with a board or with a paddle. And the girl would stand on the front of the plank, okay, and assume poses, <laughs> holding a bouquet and balancing with arms. <laughs> and so that is why I had that other picture. But Frances lived near the First Congregational Church. She had a hair's breadth escape from the Antic while she was living near the First Congregational Church. On the July 4th, she went with a group of her friends to a picnic ground on the opposite side of the Antic. To reach the picnic ground, they either had to walk two miles around to a bridge. So I've got, I think, I'll go back eventually. Um, around to get to a bridge, or the landowners on either side of the Lake the Atlantic had set up um, a makeshift bridge. It was two big timbers chained to trees, resting on the top of the water, and the two big pieces of timber rested on a pile of stones in the middle of the river. So they were not attached. And on this day in July, the stream was running high. The first part of the first timber was submerged, so the boys in the party had gotten some flat rocks and placed them on the timbers, and then urged the girls to cross. The first girl traveled safely across the makeshift grid, shouted to her companions to follow. Frances, who often wrote how about timid she was, was inspired to follow. 
And she wrote, she reached midstream where the water was the highest. When the whole world went topsy-turvy and she fell in and found herself struggling in a current where the water was only way steep. She could not get to her feet. She could not get to the edge. She could hear her sister and the other girl shrieking in fear. And she was being swept down the river. Fortunately, one of the boys jumped in and put his hand out and grabbed her and pulled her to shore. She wrote, the near disaster didn't stop the party. She went home to change into dry clothes. And she and her rescuer led the first set of dances. Um, so sometimes she was brave. Um, Despite the economic challenges faced by Hawthorne's family, at age 16, she had one of the most influential events in her life. She actually gained access to the new revolutionary ideas about women's education at an academy opened in 1811 by two extraordinary Norwich teenagers, Lydia Huntley, who became Lydia Huntley Sigourney, and Nancy Hyde, Francis's neighbor from next door. Both girls had suffered through the genteel education made available to girls prior to this idea of Republican motherhood, Republican education. They were determined to provide a different kind of education for girls in Norwich. Under their guidance, Cochran's required an education of much higher quality than normally available to a poor child. And she also found inspiration and a lifelong mentor in Lydia Huntley, Lydia Huntley Sigourney. Now let me give you briefly what Hyde and Huntley did. Both of them were poor. You probably know that Lydia Huntley's family lived on the Lathrop Estate, and that's really the only reason that Lydia Huntley had any aspirations to gentility. But both Lydia and Nancy were profoundly disappointed in what their education had taught them. So they determined to self-educate themselves to be able to provide education in what they called serious subjects to open a school to support their families. But more importantly, to pass on this higher level of education to other girls. Now, the school had to attract paying pupils. So friends and family said to Lydia and Nancy, who at this point were about 18, that well, you know, to get paying customers, you're going to have to teach needlepoint. You're going to have to teach painting on ivory. You're going to have to teach flower <laughs> arranging. So the two of them went to Hartford for the winter to learn these so called genteel skills. Um, they have learned to arrange flowers, paint vases, do fine needlework. Hyde despised her time in Hartford. <laughs> she wrote, choice would never have instigated me to such an employment. And she wrote that painting flowers was an employment of which I do not approve, which of course neither with my taste nor my temperament. <laughs> this is the young woman that Frances had known since she was seven. The girls opened the school in the fall of 1911. Frances was one of their students. Although the school did offer fine arts, the two young women were more interested in offering a challenging curriculum. They provided daily lessons in ancient and modern history, geography, natural and moral philosophy. They had the girls keep daily journals. This is probably where Frances, at age 16, started keeping a journal. It's one of the documents I have never found. If you ever find a journal that covers 60 years or 55 years of F.M. Calkins' life, email me immediately. <laughs> okay? Um, some of the girls wrote poetry in their journals. This may be where Frances developed her interest in poetry. Grammar, logic, arithmetic, calculus, penmanship took precedence over Bible reading, prayer, recitation, and spelling. Nancy Hyde was clear about the school's goals. Usefulness should be the goal of education. Usefulness included intellectual pursuits because Nancy Hyde understood that in 1811, women could not play a public role in society, but they needed comprehensive general knowledge to be able to teach their children, but also to understand what was going on. Hyde articulated that knowledge should make women to a degree independent of the world. She clearly was not just interested in molding the next generation of mothers. Huntley, a little more practical, 
One goal of the school was to teach girls a strong sense of their duty. She supported journal writing as it would create the habit of reflection. But she also wrote that she wanted the girls to be able to think with clearness and express their thoughts concisely. I say that to my students at UConn in 2019. <laughs> For Frances, her four months with Hyde and Huntley were critical to her later blossoming as a writer. She spent two months in the fall of 18, uh, 1811 and two months in the winter, four months total. Both women encouraged her to write. She kept a record of her first composition. Then the document at the New London County Historical Site. The title is Antiquities. Considering her later fascination with history, the title is revealing. She valued her time with Huntley and Hyde, saying they later taught, saying later they taught her to love learning for its own sake. She wrote of the dove-like days, the diligent, earnest, mind-expanding group of students at the school. She remained lifelong friends with Huntley, even after Huntley moved to Hartford and married Charles Sigmund. Lydia Huntley published a collection of her own essays in 1815. The school closed very quickly, by the way. And Lydia included her own poems, but also some of the lectures she had delivered to the girls. And at that point, a woman publishing a book didn't just go to a publisher here and say, the woman had to raise money by subscription. And in the book is a list of subscribers, and Francis is in there for the sum of $1. Okay. Nancy Hyde died in 1816. And Lydia Huntley raised money to, to publish a collection of Hyde's writings, including Hyde's prose and poetry and journal. And she also asked some of Hyde's students to write about their experience with Hyde. So Huntley asked Frances Hawkins to write about Hyde. Frances had always felt a special kinship with Hyde, not just because of being neighbors, but Francis's father died before Francis was born. Francis's father worked for his father-in-law, and he had gone to Port-au-Prince with a load of sheep hides and shoes to sell in the West Indies. He died of a virulent fever and was buried in the Strangers Cemetery in Port-au-Prince. And Francis wrote, as though she'd been there, although she was still in utero, that her mother was on Manwaring Hill, which, without trees in New London, you can see all the way down to the mouth of the river. And she saw the sails that looked like the sails of the ship that her husband was on. And she'd been expecting him back daily. She was about four months pregnant with Francis. And she had a two-year-old daughter. And she watched the ship work its way up the river. And then she saw her youngest brother-in-law kind of come in and stand next to her. But he didn't approach her, and he looked very upset. And he had to deliver the news that Joshua Hawkins had died in Port-au-Prince. So Fanny Hawkins, Fa sorry, Fanny <coughs> Hawkins was 19 years old when she gave birth to her second child. And Francis never knew her father. Nancy Hyde's father had died at sea when Nancy was young. So Frances felt a special affinity for Nancy. And she wrote a maudlin poem, typical of the maudlin poetry of the area. The poem is called T Lines to the Memory of Miss Nancy Maria Hyde. The poem outlined the